What did the Apostle Paul teach about the law of God? Did he teach that it was done away with for Christians and you didn't need to keep it? Did he teach that only the Jews needed to keep it? Or did he teach that the whole world was under the jurisdiction of the law of God so that everybody needed to keep it? What did he teach? Stay tuned, we'll see. Welcome to Steps to Life with Dr. John Grossbaum. Sabbath rest is a promise between God and His children. Bible prophecy tells us that we are living in the last days of this earth's history before Jesus' second coming. Today's program will help you prepare for these coming events. Stay tuned. Thanks for joining us. Before we look in the scriptures to find out what did the Apostle Paul teach about the law of God, Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us understand what we're going to read from His holy book. Father in heaven, we thank you for the Bible. We thank you for Bible prophecy that helps us to understand what is going to happen in the future and how to be ready for it. And we earnestly pray that your Holy Spirit will teach us the truth as we open it and read it now. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to today's program. Numerous surveys and questionnaires have confirmed that the most popular form of modern skepticism is to deny the creation story. Today's free book is entitled, Why God Said to Remember. To receive your free copy, simply call 1-800-THE-TRUTH and ask for offer LS28. Call now to receive your book. And now, Pastor John Grosball. In Acts, the 15th chapter, we read that there were some people that came and taught the Christians in Antioch that unless you were circumcised according to the manner of Moses, you could not be saved. This is what it says. And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So, we read then in verse 5, it says, Some of the sect of the Pharisees believed, rose up, saying, It is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Now, it was decided by this Jerusalem council that it was not necessary to require the Christians to keep the law of Moses and to be circumcised. And the Apostle Paul made some very strong statements concerning this in his letters. And as a result of these statements in Paul's letters and this, what is mentioned here in Acts the 15th chapter, some people have concluded that the Apostle Paul taught that Christians don't need to keep the law of God. Let's read those strong statements and see exactly what they say. First of all, in the book of Ephesians, the second chapter, we read this. It says, For he himself, that is Christ, is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of division between us, that is, between the Jews and the Gentiles, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. It says here in verse 15, that Christ abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances. So people have said, see, it says that Christ abolished the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so we don't need to keep the law of God. There is a statement that is just as strong as this in the book of Colossians, the second chapter, starting with verse 14. It says, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it, that is in the cross. Therefore, let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come 
but the substance is of Christ. Let no one defraud you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom all the body, nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments, grows with the increase which is from God. Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourself to regulations or ordinances? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle. He goes on to say these things have an appearance of humility and of sanctimoniousness and a, an appearance that, that a person is holy and religious, but he says they're really of no value. And so, from what Paul says in Colossians 2, from what Paul says in, Gla in Ephesians 2, and from seeing what happened in Acts 15, where the apostles said, no, the Christians do not need to be circumcised. They do not need to keep the law of Moses. People have concluded that Paul taught that the law of God was not binding on Christians and you don't need to keep it. Some people have qualified that a little bit and they said, well, it's necessary to keep the seventh commandment because even though they released the Christians from being circumcised and keeping the law of Moses, they required them to keep the seventh commandment of the Ten Commandments. Let's just read about that though in Acts 15 and see exactly what happened. Here's what the message was that they sent to the Christian churches. It says, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. So, people say, see, it is mentioned that Christians do need to keep the seventh commandment, but none of the rest of the commandments are mentioned. But that's not hard to understand if you understand what was going on in the nations of the ancient world. You see, the nations of the ancient world knew that it was wrong and they had strict penalties against a person who would steal his neighbor's wife. They had strict penalties in the nations of the ancient world against adultery, against taking somebody else's spouse. They knew that was wrong. But the nations in the, in the ancient world, many of them, did not think that fornication was wrong. They knew that adultery was wrong. They knew that it was wrong for you to take somebody else's wife. But they thought that if you went and had sexual relations with somebody that wasn't married, that it didn't matter. And so the apostles pointed out to the Christians, it's not only adultery that is included in the seventh commandment, it is all manner of sexual immorality. So that's why that was specifically pointed out because there were Gentile Christians that didn't understand what the seventh commandment meant. It's also interesting to study the other prohibitions here that were given by the apostles, that they told them they were not to eat of blood, which is an amazing thing today. Millions of Christians all over the world eat blood. They eat blood in the meat that they're eating. They're not eating kosher meat, and yet the apostles strictly forbid the Gentile Christians to eat blood. Do you know that there is no permission given anywhere in the whole Bible for a person who is follower of the Lord to eat blood? Well, that's not a subject. What did the Apostle Paul then teach about the law of God? Did he teach that it was done away with? Well, he said the law containing of commandments containing ordinances was abolished. But he also taught that there was a law that was not abolished. Let's read that. In Romans, the third chapter, and verse 31, we read this. It says, Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. Notice, he says the law is not made void. It's not abolished. It's established. Now, let's think that through. Can you abolish a law and establish a law at the same time? Absolutely not. A schoolboy knows that. You cannot abolish a law and establish a law at the same time. 
And Paul says in Ephesians 2.15 that there is a law of commandments containing ordinances that is abolished. But he says in Romans 3.31 that there is a law that is established. Notice this is not some new law that was given in New Testament times. It is a law from the times of the Old Testament that by faith in Christ is established. Now let's think through how is it, what law is established by faith in Christ? Paul says that where there is no law, there is no transgression. Romans 4, 15. And he says in Romans 7 that if, there, if the law wasn't there, I wouldn't even know what sin was. Because as John says, sin is the transgression of the law. And why did Jesus have to die on the cross? Why was that necessary? Why couldn't God save the human race without that? Well, notice what Paul says about it to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 he says, I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Why did Christ die? Christ died for our sins. What is sin? You would think that everybody in the world by today would know what sin is, wouldn't you? But many do not. Sin, the Bible says, is breaking God's law. If God does not have a law, or if the law is not in effect, then there isn't any transgression. Then there isn't any sin. If you don't have a law, then there isn't any sin. And if you don't have a sin, you don't need a sacrifice. You don't need a gospel. The gospel is to save men from sin. Remember, sin is breaking God's law. So the gospel is to save men from breaking God's law. The gospel doesn't save men in breaking God's law. It saves men from breaking God's law. Read the words of the angel to Joseph before the birth of Jesus in Matthew 1, 21. So, there was a law that was abolished when Christ came. A law having to do with ordinances, Paul says. A law having to do with foods and drinks and feast days and different things. Yearly ceremonies, you can read about in Leviticus 23. Those things were done away. Those were temporary laws that were given, that were prophetic of things that would happen in the gospel dispensation in the future. But the law of God, the Ten Commandment law, was not done away. In fact, Paul says it was established. And notice how strong he states it to the Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians, the 7th chapter and the 19th verse, he says, Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but keeping the commandments of the law of God. Or many translations add the words, Keeping the commandments of God is what matters or is everything. That's in the context, but that word is not in the original text. Circumcision isn't anything. Whether you're circumcised or whether you're not circumcised is not the issue. The issue is, do you keep the commandments of God? That is an issue. He says that is what matters. 1 Corinthians 7, 19. He talks to the Romans also about this in great detail. He says that if a person has received the Holy Spirit, that person will be obedient to the law of the Ten Commandments. And he's just been talking about the Ten Commandments in Romans 7, and he mentions one of them and says what it is. He quotes it, and then he says concerning this law, he says, if you've received the Holy Spirit, you'll be obedient to it. Let's read that. This is, this is in Romans 8, verses 1 to 4. It says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Notice, Paul said that those that do not walk according to the flesh, those that walk according to the Spirit, those people that are filled with the Holy Spirit, the righteous requirement of the law will be fulfilled in their life. Is the righteous fulfillment is the righteous requirement of the law being fulfilled in your life? 
if you are filled with the Holy Spirit, Paul says, the righteous requirement of the law will be fulfilled in your life. Romans 8, 4. Well, what about the person that's not filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, Paul says that person's not going to keep the law. In fact, he says a person that has a sinful nature who has not been converted, who has not received the Holy Spirit, that person can't keep the law of God. Notice how he states it. This is Romans, the eighth chapter. He says, for to be carnally minded, fleshly minded, is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. Notice, he says the carnal mind, the person that's not converted, that person is not subject to the law of God. In fact, it's impossible, nor indeed can that person be subject to the law of God. But then he goes on to say, that's not your situation. You've chosen to follow Christ. You're filled with the Holy Spirit. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Now, the Apostle Paul, though, taught that there was coming a time in the future of the Christian church when multitudes of people who would consider themselves Christians would violate the law of God and still expect that they're going to go to heaven anyway, even though they were living in deliberate violation of the law of God. Now, how can that happen? The Apostle Paul predicted that such a thing was going to happen in the Christian church. Stay tuned and we'll read what he predicted. Welcome back. The Apostle Paul taught that there was going to be an antichrist power that would enter the Christian church and cause and teach Christians to break the law of God. Actually, the Apostle Paul was not the first one that predicted this. This is predicted clear back in the Old Testament. If we go to the book of Daniel, for instance, in Daniel, the seventh chapter and verse 25, the prophet is talking about the Antichrist. We know that he is because he says that this power will speak great words against the Most High God. This is how, it's, how it reads in Daniel 7, verse 25. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. So it says here in Daniel 7 that there is going to arise an antichrist power that will speak great words against the Most High, and that this power is going to intend. It's going to be their intentional purpose to change the law of God, to change the times and the laws of God. It says here to change, Daniel 7, 25, he shall intend to change times and law. The Apostle Paul talks about this same Antichrist power in his letters. If you look in the Apostle Paul's letter to the Thessalonian church, the second one, 2 Thessalonians 2, this is what he says. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. The Apostle Paul here predicts that the second coming of Christ is not going to occur in his day. It's not going to occur in the days of the apostolic church. It, before that happens, there's going to be a great apostasy first, a great falling away, and the Antichrist is going to be revealed. And notice how he describes it. He says, this Antichrist, or man of sin, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. The Antichrist will sit in the temple of God. Now, if we look back in Ephesians 2, verses 19 to 22, the church of God is likened to a temple. A temple is a building where a deity resides. The church is to be a temple for the indwelling of God, but the Antichrist is going to sit in the temple. In other words, in the church. 
The Antichrist is going to arise in the church and he's going to exalt himself above every God that is worshiped and he's going to show himself that he himself is God. And then he says this, Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed. Notice the Antichrist is described here as the lawless one. In Daniel, the Antichrist is described as a power that intends to change times and law. Here it's described as a lawless power, a power that teaches people to break God's law. And how long is this Antichrist power going to continue? It's going to continue until Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven and then it's going to be destroyed. This is what Paul says. Notice what he says. He says, Then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one, he's going to be revealed and he's going to continue until Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. And when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, the Antichrist's power will be destroyed with the brightness of his coming. That's what we read in verse 8. He says in verse 9, The coming of the lawless one, that's the Antichrist, is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Friend, do you love the truth? Did you know that we read in this scripture, Paul says, if you don't receive the love of the truth, you're going to be deceived. You're going to be deceived by miracles that will be performed by evil spirits, but you will think that the miracles are being performed by the Holy Spirit. How are you going to tell the difference? Notice what it says in verse 11 and 12. It says, For this reason God will send them strong delusion, that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So, the people that believe the lie and have pleasure in unrighteousness, they're still going to lose their soul. They, they can say, Well, Lord, I, I didn't know I was deceived you're still going to be destroyed because you didn't receive the love of the truth and you had pleasure in unrighteousness. How is it with you today, friend? You know what unrighteousness is. The Bible says in 1 John 5 that all unrighteousness is sin and sin is breaking God's law. Having pleasure in unrighteousness is taking pleasure in sin, taking pleasure in breaking God's law. And those people will all be condemned. That's what the Apostle Paul taught. We just read it here in 2 Thessalonians 2, 12. It says that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. We read the very same thing in the book of Revelation 13, where it's talking about the Antichrist power. It reveals to us the startling fact that in the very last days, almost the entire world is going to worship the Antichrist power. Now remember, the Ten Commandments forbid anyone to worship anybody else except the God of heaven. The Ten Commandments and the Second Commandment forbids a person to bow down to any image or idol. But notice what's going to happen. It says here, it says, All the world marveled and followed the beast. And then it says in verse 8, all who dwell on the earth will worship him. So is that everybody? Well, not quite. It says, All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. We're coming to a time when everybody in the world, except those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life, everybody else in the whole world is going to worship the Antichrist. Who are you going to worship? In Revelation, over and over again, it is pointed out that in the last days, the dividing line that will divide the peoples of the world into two groups is on one side will be those that keep God's commandments and on the other side will be those who worship the Antichrist and the image of the Antichrist, as you read in Revelation 13 and 14. This is described in Revelation 12, 17. It says here in Revelation 12, 17, 
that the dragon, that's the devil, the dragon was enraged with the woman. The woman is God's people. And when he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. The devil is enraged with those that keep God's commandments and he goes to try to destroy them. And you read about how he tries to destroy them in Revelation 13. He causes a law to be passed that if you don't worship the Antichrist and the image to the Antichrist, you're going to be killed. So the devil's going to try to destroy every person that keeps God's commandments. But God's children will still be keeping His commandments because we read in Revelation 14, 12, it says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Oh, friend, that is where our world is tending. We're headed toward a gigantic spiritual crisis in our world that is going to divide the whole world into two camps. And the two camps are simply going to be the people that keep God's commandments and the people that don't keep God's commandments. It's just that simple. The book of Revelation divides the whole world into two camps in the last days by that criteria. And notice in the last chapters of the book of Revelation, this warning is repeated. In fact, in the last two chapters, it's repeated at least, at least three times. We will just look at one here in Revelation 22, 14 and 15. It says, Blessed are those who do His commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral, that th those that break the seventh commandment, and murderers, those that break the sixth commandment, and idolaters, those that break the second commandment, and whoever loves and practices a lie, those are those that break the ninth commandment. You see, the final analysis whether you're on the inside or whether you're on the outside in the last generation depends on whether you are loyal to God's law. And the Apostle Paul taught the very same thing in 2 Thessalonians 2.